Hello everyone, my name is Dr. Sam Hurst and I have been invited by Dr. Melissa Julian Jones to talk to you today about the history of Mary Prince in the context of black writing and the abolitionary movement in the late 18th and early 19th centuries. Um, by black writing, I do of course mean black writing in the Anglophone tradition because that's what we're talking about with Mary Prince. Now, you might not be familiar with much black writing in this tradition in the 18th or early 19th centuries. You might not even have known it existed, but I can assure you that it did. And that there are a number of black writers. A great place to start if you're interested and wanting to find out more is with the anthology Unchained Voices, which includes excerpts or writings from all of the people on the left and really showcases or shows the variety of different writings being produced by black writers in the period. Now, having said variety, it's worth noting as well that there is a particular black tradition of writing occurring in the period, which mixes the autobiographical with anti-slavery rhetoric, with anti-slavery subtexts, and was a key part both um, in the work of the abolitionary movement and in um, galvanizing the abolitionary movement. Now, if we're thinking about a black tradition, um, connected to the slave trade within uh, Britain, it's worth pointing to some key texts of black writing within that tradition in the 18th century. One of the first black written texts um, was um, Ignatius Sancho's uh, letters, which were posthumously published in 1782. Um, now, Ignatius Sancho was a formerly enslaved man who became a shopkeeper among other things, and he had other writings, including, for example, two plays, but it's his letters that have become the most famous and the most recognizable and are still easily accessible today, as are all the texts I'm about to mention. And his letters give his ideas and positions on a number of different issues, and they also give an idea of his life. So with the 1780s, we see the rise of the abolitionary movement, and increasingly we're seeing black authored texts becoming a part of that abolitionary movement. The really early example of this, the first example of a black anti-slavery text being written in Britain is the thoughts and sentiments on the evil and wicked traffic and the slavery and commerce of the human species by Otto Guano. Um, now, this was considered radical at the time. It called for the total abolition of slavery rather than the gradual diminution or uh, for the uh, removal of the slave trade, for example. It was a targeted abolitionary text and it was sent to key politicians and figures in the royal family. However, it did not meet with great success because of the perceived radicalism of its stance. Now, Aladu Equiano was another key figure and his interesting life um, was incredibly popular and he became something of a literary celebrity, um, traveling around England on a literary tour. He also um, was a key face of uh, sort of black Africans in the period in Britain or black Britons um, uh, writing essays, appearing in newspapers and uh, being sort of a, a, a well-known figure. Now his interesting life details the story of his uh, childhood in Africa, his kidnap and enslavement, his service on a, in the British Navy, um, his forced removal from Britain once again and being sent to the West Indies where he worked as a clerk on board a ship and later as an overseer of a plantation, first of all, as an enslaved man, um, but then later having bought his freedom as a free man and returning to England. The text mixes together a range of different genres. It is, of course, autobiographical, but it involves um, a spiritual autobiography in the tradition of figures like Bunyan and George Fox, those in that Protestant dissenting tradition. It also includes a uh, sort of genre of travel writing and travel writing and venture. Um, and of course includes anti-slavery subtexts and rhetoric as part of the narrative itself. Now, Mary Prince, I think, can usefully be connected to that tradition in which we see Equiano writing. Like him, she's writing a semi-autobiographical text or an autobiographical text, um, which is sort of has an aim to produce uh, anti-slavery or abolitionary sentiment. Of course, their aims uh, and purposes are different for a variety of reasons, but one of the reasons that we're seeing a different emphasis in both of these texts is because of the historical period in which they're writing and the particular context of the abolitionary movement at that time and of the progress of the abolition of slavery. So it's worth sort of putting them within that historical context briefly. Now, we're seeing in the 18th and 17th centuries the rise of abolitionary sentiment 
From 1637, the Quakers were already uncomfortable with slavery and starting to work against it. George Fox, one of the founders of uh, Quaker, Quakerism, um, was writing in 1637 to the friends beyond the seas that have black and Indian slaves, a reminder that all are equal under God. Now, although he was not specifically forbidding the slave trade or slave holding, um, we're already seeing the direction in which Quakers are moving in terms of their theology around the slave trade or slavery. And by the 18th century, we're seeing uh, increasingly condemnations of the slave trade and slave holding within the Quaker community, leading, for example, in the early part of the 18th century um, to the Philadelphia meeting, uh, basically outlawing within its community slave holding. Um, by 1783, the official Quaker position is anti-slavery and anti-slave holding, and we're seeing them start to move outside of the community in terms of action being taken, sending a petition to the London Yearly Meeting in 1783 and starting one of the first British abolitionary groups, the Meetings for Sufferings. This wasn't the only abolitionary group which was appearing at the time, of course. And we do have, for example, localised groups such as the one in Manchester, which were uh, abolitionary groups. Um, uh, interdenominational in some cases. In terms of other um, religious uh, denominations and groups, there was rarely a set position. Some denominations leaned towards abolition, others towards pro-slavery discourse and others were divided. Um, John Wesley was of course the founder of Methodism and his thoughts upon slavery was virulently anti-slavery. However, Methodism itself included uh, figures who both promoted and condemned the slave trade. The Anglican Church um, was divided again. Many evangelical Anglicans were part of the movement for abolition, but there was a distinct conservative movement within the Anglican Church that promoted its own economic interests and the economic interests of its members in promoting the slave trade. Now, the key sort of text um, that uh, produced sort of anti-slavery sentiment and was key in the abolitionary movement is James Ramsey's essay on the treatment and conversion of African slaves in the British sugar colonies. Now we're seeing by the late 1780s a move really towards action. Figures such as the Quakers and other dissenters were not able to take direct parliamentary action themselves because of the discriminatory religious laws of the time which banned them from holding political positions. However, um, the Society for the Abolition of the Slave Trade was set up in 87 with a group of Quakers joining together with evangelical Anglicans, Granville Sharp and Thomas Clarkson, inviting William Wilberforce to present their case in Parliament. So we're beginning to see direct parliamentary action, but this was not the only way in which the abolitionary movement was set forward and uh, promoted in the period. We have figures like Unitarian Josiah Wedgwood um, producing the medallion, Am I Not a Man and a Brother? which was key in promulgating anti-slavery uh, anti and abolitionary sentiment. It became uh, something of a fashion symbol at the time. We're also seeing mass movements such as the sugar boycott of 1791 to two in which over 300,000 families participated. All of this pressure eventually led to the abolition of the Slave Trade Act in 1807, followed over 30 years later by the abolition of slavery in the British Empire. Now it's always worth noting when we look at these dates as I'm sure um, uh, Melissa Julian Jones will have told you that this wasn't really the end either of the slave trade or of the abolition of slavery, unfortunately. And we see ways in which uh, practices continued. And we see this as well in the case of Mary Prince, as I will go into further detail on when we discuss Mary Prince herself. Now, if we're thinking about the positioning of Alado Equiano and the positioning of Mary Prince, we can see how they fit into different periods within the abolitionary movement. Ado Aquiano is part of the 1780s rise um, of the abolitionary movement, which was in, um, encouraging publishing and promoting uh, black written texts as part of this abolitionary movement alongside a far greater number of uh, white written texts as well. Um, it was arguing for the abolition of the slave trade um, as well as the abolition of slavery more broadly. By of course, Mary Prince, we have already 50 years of history of black writing almost. And we are seeing uh, uh, in the abolitionary movement and we're seeing not uh, a sort of movement for the abolition of the slave trade as that was abolished uh, theoretically at least in 1807, but rather towards the abolition of slavery itself and slave holding within the British empire. Now, all of those details I've given lean towards a sort of emphasis on white actors within the abolitionary movement and white voices. It's worth noting, though, 
there is a tendency to do this, to focus on white activists and white voices and to ignore the agency uh, voices and actions of black abolitionists in the period. But black figures were key to the abolitionary movement. Um, and we have, for example, the group, the Sons of Africa in Britain, um, who are a group of black Britons who petitioned uh, Westminster to listen to debates on abolition, wrote letters and uh, got involved in public speaking and letter writing campaigns, and also were involved, involved in newspaper publications. Again, they were barred from political power, but were key in promulgating the messages of abolition and a key tool in promoting these messages of abolition were these narratives such as Aladdo Equiano's and Mary Prince's, these autobiographical narratives, um, which talked about the conditions of slavery and slaveholding within the British Empire. Now, Mary Prince, as you'll know if you've already read the text, um, was born in Bermuda to an enslaved family. Um, she was uh, owned and sold various times by various enslavers, but was brought to England in 1828 by the Woods. Um, now, the Woods um, were kept treating her poorly uh, and cruelly um, and uh, condemning her uh, ability to work because she was um, effectively disabled at this point um, and kept telling her that she should leave if she could, essentially mocking her. After the Somerset case of 1772, um, there was sort of the broader idea that uh, once in England, you were not enslaved. So even though Mary Prince is theoretically free and she could theoretically leave, which the woods keep throwing in her face, they know full well that she doesn't have the support or the economic assistance to do so. However, after four times of being told to leave, she, um, she does and appeals to the Moravians for assistance who assist her to find accommodation and then later a job and assist her um, with her health as well. Now Mary Prince's aim is to return home uh, to her husband in the West Indies but we find that the woods after leaving England refused to grant her a manumission meaning that if she returned she would be enslaved again and this is how we see this idea of the slave trade being over not actually quite uh, occurring in truth um, because she could be free but then enslaved again depending on her position within the British Empire. Now as part of her uh, case against the woods to create public sympathy and also uh, sort of more broadly to take part in uh, the abolitionary movement we see the publication of the history of Mary Prince a West Indian slave in 1831. Now, it's important to note that there are at least two different aims or sources of aims for this text. There's Mary Prince's own writing and own aims to tell her story and uh, to get back home. And there's also uh, the aims of the white abolitionists who are involved in the publication of this narrative, Susanna Strickland, who transcribed it, and Thomas Pringle, who edited it, and who is the society, is a secretary for the Society for the Mitigation and Gradual Abolition of Slavery, who were keen to use this text as a wider part of the abolitionary movement in the period. Um, it's worth noting that this book led to two liable cases, by the way, involving uh, Woods and uh, Thomas Pringle, because Mary Prince was essentially sued for liable against Woods, or Thomas Pringle was because of Mary Prince's words. And the courts ruled in Woods' favour because her word as a black woman was not enough. Now, we have to think about this text, obviously, as an autobiography, but an autobiography is never simply a mimetic reflection of reality. It's not simply a mirror held up um, to the world. We have to understand autobiographies as constructed texts. They're part of a literary genre. They're part of a literary tradition. They have specific aims and they have specific techniques. And there is, as I've noted, a tradition of black writing, black autobiographical writing that is working towards anti-slavery aims or anti-slave trade aims. We see this in Alado Equiano, we see it in many texts and in Mary Prince, of course. So I'm going to pull out a couple of the devices that Mary Prince is using. Um, now, this isn't to suggest that the text is manipulative in any way or that it is false. It's simply to point out the way in which it is constructed. If we think of it simply as a mirror to the truth, we're missing the ways in which this is a complex text. We're missing the ways in which it is a literary text and we're diminishing 
uh, both Mary Prince's agency and her ability to construct a text. So let me take you through a couple of these rhetorical devices that we find in Prince and in other black writers. First of all, there's the idea of English people would never. And you see an example of this here. She says, oh, the horrors of slavery, how the thought of it pains my heart, but the truth ought to be told of it. And what my eyes have seen, I think it is my duty to relate. A few people in England know what slavery is. So here we have the idea that I'm telling you English people because you don't know what it's like in the West Indies. And if you did know, you wouldn't let it continue. Now, of course, this is a technique because British people do know. English people have had almost 50 years of black written autobiographical text detailing the lives of black people in the West Indies. The information is there, the information is known. And we see this as a constant technique in black writing, this appeal to the better moral selves of those Britons, but not condemning, but saying it's because you don't know. It's the imputation of ignorance in order to appeal to the, the sort of moral side of these Britons. Another way in which these texts is creating its readers or creating an idea of its readers is through the appeal to sensibility. So sensibility was a sort of 18th century moment, let us say. Sensibility itself is the idea of increased emotional sensitivity and em emotional connection to moral virtue um, and empathy particularly. So what Mary Prince is positing in her text uh, subtextually is the sensibility of her reader and trying to appeal to that sensibility and to create a particular emotional effect in the work that she's doing. So we have her here describing her separation from her mother and she creates a really clear visual image which is meant to arouse the empathy and sensibility of those reading. It's also meant to create a sort of universal image of the mother and creating this sense of kinship and uh, similarity between her and those reading. And she says, it recalls the great grief that filled my heart and the woeful thoughts that passed to and fro through my mind while listening to the pitiful words of my poor mother, weeping for the loss of her children. You can see that very clear, almost universal image appealing, particularly perhaps to women readers um, at, at the time. Uh, this kind of idea of the suffering woman being promoted and this appeal to the supposed sensibility of her readers. We also find appeals to religion as key in these texts. In Lado Equiano, we have a full spiritual autobiography. In Mary Prince, less so. She has a, a perhaps a less uh, developed religious consciousness, but there is an inclusion of her conversion and a sort of religious framing as well for much of the texts. We have here uh, her sort of story of uh, involvement with the Moravian church, where she uh, realizes her sins and confesses them. Now, what's going on with these appeals to religion? There's a number of different things. Of course, we never want um, to uh, talk uh, poorly of people's religious beliefs. And these are a reflection of her sincerely held religious beliefs. But it's also something to note here in the fact that so many, if not all of these black narratives include these conversion stories or include these stories of the move to Christianity. Um, and why they're considered an important part of these narratives and why these are the texts which are being promoted and published by white abolitionists. Of course, there's an idea of an acceptable blackness that this conversion to Christianity is part of have a look at the texts that were published and promoted by white abolitionists and have a look at the idea of black people and black citizens that they were trying to create and promote. There's a sense in which, as I'll go into later, that the white abolitionary movement to some extent takes from the voice and agency of those black writers writing in the period. We see this quite overtly and extremely with Mary Prince. Because what we find with Mary Prince, what came up in the libel cases is that the story that she told, details of it were deliberately removed by Susanna Strickland and Thomas Pringle to show her in a particular light, to create a particular image of her, an acceptable blackness. Um, 
because they removed all references to her sexual relations within the text. Um, as far as uh, we are aware, they were consensual sexual relations with people that were not her enslavers, although there is also mention of sexual assault within the text itself, of course. But the, the bits that they removed were the consensual sexual relations, um, as far as I'm aware. Um, because of trying to create this particular image of Mary Prince that would be acceptable to their readers, would be acceptable to those reading the text and will be acceptable within the context of the abolitionary movement. Now, that's quite an extreme case of it, but this emphasis on religion and religion and conversion on the Christianity of pretty much every single black African who was writing in this period and being published shows the emphasis which was being put on how black people had to present themselves, how they had to write, how they had to be in order to be supported, promoted, and have their words considered and respected. And we also find in Mary Prince, of course, anti-slavery arguments. We have here her speech when she leaves the woods, which lays out clearly her mistreatment. It lays out clearly the conditions under which she's left, um, sort of subtextually promotes the idea of her freedom in England um, and of her right to leave as well. And suggests because of this, um, because of this freedom, there is a suggestion of the iniquity of the fact that she would be enslaved if she left uh, and returned home. Um, so anti-slavery arguments are wound in to the text as well, um, either very overtly with her ideas about freedom is very sweet, for example, or slightly more subtextually as we find here. Now, I've already mentioned the ways in which white voices were often controlling these black narratives in some way, either through what black uh, white abolitionists, sorry, were willing to, uh, to publish, um, uh, the idea of acceptable blackness that they were willing to promote or, or willing to encourage um, in terms of what was being published. Um, but we also find uh, white editorial voices becoming particularly in Mary Prince through its paratexts, incredibly overt, incredibly noisy, um, and incredibly obvious. There are various paratexts uh, within Mary Prince, and paratext means extra texts, basically, extra elements, not the, the main narrative itself. So we have the story of Asarasa, which is just a story of another black person, essentially, which Thomas Pringle has just jammed on there. Um, which takes away from the idea of the individuality and agency and, and personhood of Mary Prince to say, oh, well, you know, just the same, pop another one on. Um, we have testimony needs to her veracity, both sort of letters about her character and accommodation for people who knew her. We also have the reference to the physical exams that have been carried out. Um, <clears throat> so these testimonies to veracity are considered necessary and white voices are considered necessary to back up her testimony. We also have commentary from Pringle on certain aspects of the text and we have extended footnotes. So we have a very kind of intrusive white editing voice here. Um, we also have a sense in which uh, Mary's voice itself has been uh, changed perhaps. Um, we have uh, Thomas Pringle tells us that her narrative was written out fully with all the narrator's repetitions and prolixities and afterwards pruned into its present shape, retaining as far as was practicable, Mary's exact expressions and peculiar phraseology. No fact of importance has been omitted, not a single circumstance or sentiment has been added. Well, we know it, we know that things have been taken away. Um, and it is essentially her own without any material alteration further than was requisite to exclude redundancies and gross grammatical errors so as to render it clearly in intelligible. Now, if you're reading this and filling with rage, me too. Um, this is uh, a fairly horrendous way to talk about Mary Prince. Um, it's also very clearly showing the extent to which this narrative, both in terms of its phrasing and in terms of its content, was being uh, manipulated or controlled by those uh, white editors. Um, and we're finding sort of the next step in the process was after it had been written out, I went over the whole carefully, examining her on every fact and circumstance detailed. All that relates to her residence in Antigua. I had the advantage of being assisted in the scrutiny by Mr. Joseph Phillips, who was a resident in that colony during the same period and had known her there. So again, we have this emphasis on needing to prove the veracity of Mary Prince, that her word isn't good enough. Um, in itself. 
So when we're thinking about Mary Prince's diary, we have to think about it within the tradition. We have to think about what it's doing, what techniques it's using, what its aims are. But we also have to think about as well, bear in mind how much this narrative is being controlled, changed or influenced by the demands of those white abolitionary editors and the white abolitionary movement concerns and emphases. So a couple of questions to just leave you with to think about. To what extent can we hear Mary's voice in her own narrative? Do you think? Um, and if we considered the anti-slavery autobiographical narrative as a particular genre, what are some of its key rhetorical features, components and stylistic concerns? You might want to think about the ones I've already mentioned or see what else you can find in Mary Prince. And then what arguments can you find being preemptively countered by the narrative? So what things can you see Mary already uh, sort of producing an answer to as she's writing? So we could take the example of foregrounding her Christianity here. She's already foregrounding by doing that, her moral character and challenges against it. So I'll leave you with these questions. Thank you very much for listening. Um, and I hope that you enjoy the rest of your discussions about Mary Prince.